Hi everyone, welcome back to Pawpaw's Workshop. I've got some exciting news today. I just finished carving this for Halloween. You know what I use? Easel, that's right. Easel now can do the 3D carving or some people say two and a half D carving. Either way, this is fantastic with the Easel software. The folks at Inventables had been hard at work and they now are introducing the 3D carving. I want to show you how I got to this point. It's really very, very easy. Now, the first thing I want to point out to you is that this software cannot design these images, but you can import them in. You need to be able to import into 3D STL files. And there's many, many different places that you can get these different files. This particular one that I use, I actually got from the Vetrix uh, site and purchased it, downloaded it, and used that file. But again, there are many, many different sources for these files. So again, you're gonna need the 3D STL file to be able to use this in the Easel software. When you first open up the Easel software, it's gonna look like this. You're gonna have the design screen on this left side, and of course, over here on the right side, you're gonna have the preview window. What you want to do is come over to this left menu bar all the way down to the bottom and it says import 3D STL file. When you click on that, you're going to have the opportunity to choose a file. So I will click on this and bring in the pumpkin uh, jack-o'-lantern to be able to work with. Now since I've already worked with this, I actually renamed it and it is the pumpkin file that I'm uh, bringing into the easel software. When you first open up this file, your whole entire screen is going to look quite a bit different. And that's okay. It'll take a little bit of getting used to, but it's not that bad. The first thing I want to be able to say is, well, the image is here, but it's not really the image that you want. If I rotate this, you can see it. But I need to orient it in a different manner. What you'll be doing is using this menu selection over here to be able to make all the changes to your file. So the first thing I want to do is come over to the orientation. Right now it's set up where the top is actually facing down. So I'm going to click this and we're going to flip this over and by putting the bottom to the bottom it makes the image look the way it's supposed to. But you can also take a look at these others. There's the left side and you can see how it's sitting right on the left. And we could do the same thing, just have a little bit of fun. And you can see how that image is going to change. And you can see what you're going to be faced with. And it may come in oriented that way when you get your file. So just realize that it may look just a little bit strange and that's okay. But we're gonna go ahead and flip this now and put this right here. Now, the other thing that you want to take a look at is the orientation. Sometimes it'll come in and it'll be upside down. That's okay, too. You have the ability to be able to rotate it. It may be oriented in one of the other directions. But in my case, I'm just going to go ahead and rotate this back 180 degrees and orient it in a manner that makes it a little bit more sense. Now, let's look at some of the new features on here. First off, this is set up for 8 inches by 12 inches, and that was 3 quarters of an inch thick on the material. So that's the size of this green box. So the green box is the actual material, and you can see it's down here oriented at the bottom left-hand corner. It goes over right to the 8 inches, all the way up to the 12 inches, and that's what you're looking at. You can rotate it this way and get a little bit better image of what that board is actually looking like. The next blue line, the blue line represents this image itself. This is what you're looking at as far as the actual image. At this point, our orientation is correct, and we need now to move on to these next sections. The next one is the position where we want it in the uh, material. So for an example, 
our green box, the material itself, is right down here at the bottom corner, the zero, zero point, X, Y, zero position. Now with this image, you can't just grab and move. You're going to be moving everything, and that's okay. I can't take the corner of the box. I can't highlight it. Everything is done over here in this area right here. So if I want this, for an example, to be positioned in the center, that's where it is right now. And that's in the center position. If I want to move it, let's say for an example that I wanted this point right here at the 1 on the x-axis and 1 on the y-axis. All I need to do is just come over and type the 1. And that was 14. 1. There we go. And 1. And you can see how that moved it right to that point. Now you also have another feature under the edit menu. When you click on the edit menu, you have an undo function. This takes you back one step at a time. So that will take several steps to get back to the original point, but that's okay. If you just want to step back to see exactly where you want to go, you can do that. Or, of course, under the position in the menu, just type in X and your value, Y and your value, and it will move immediately. Also, if you look under the position, under the X, Y, and 0, you have a little tab there that says Center to the Material. Click on that, and it'll move there directly. The next line is the blue line. The blue line actually borders for the model itself. So we have the X, the Y, and we haven't talked about the Z. The Z, if we look at this, is right down on the surface itself. If we don't want this to cut all the way through, we need to change this z-axis. And watch what happens. If I move this up, let's just say a dramatic amount. Let's move it up 0.5. You can see how that moved it all the way up. And there's now 0.5 of an inch from the bottom edge of our image down to the bottom of the uh, material. And that's too much because what you can do you can see that this is sticking up quite a bit above, and that's not going to carve. What I like is to set this, because I don't want it to cut all the way through. I want this set at about 0.25 of an inch. And for me, that works real good. That gives me some material at the bottom, and yet that's going to cut out everything. Now you can see that this is sticking up ever so slightly above the image. We're going to take care of that in just a moment. But right now, I have my image centered exactly where I want it. I have the z-axis set where I want it, so I have a little bit of thickness underneath. So now, and we have this tab right here that you can center to the material, and of course, that's already done. So that takes care of these uh, settings right here. This next section is all about the model itself. This is how we can manipulate it. Now, for an example, if I want to be able to change the size of this, if this is too big and I want to keep everything proportioned correctly, I can lock this right here. I have it locked. We'll change this to four inches. And you can see how that made it much smaller. This image now is going to be four inches on the x-axis, and it's going to be proportionate to the height. If we don't like that, again, you can come up to the Edit menu, click the Untransformation, and it brings the model right back to the original size. So that's how this works. Now, what about the z-axis? The z-axis is how thick this image actually is. Now, I've already shown you that this image is sticking above just ever so slightly. So we need to make an adjustment. So I want to be able to change this, and we're going to reduce this down. Let's try 0.6 of an inch. And you can see now that that's really, really close. Now that's looking real good, but it's still sticking up just ever so slightly. I get in real close. Put that right there, and you can see that little green line 
and how that's sticking up just a little bit. What that'll do is it'll create a flat spot on the picture. We don't want that. So I'm going to change this. Let's go down to 0.5 of an inch. We'll just change it by one tenth of an inch. And you can see how that now is underneath. So that takes care of it. When that carves now, that's going to be fine. Now you will lose ever so slightly, perhaps a little bit of detail. But if you look at this, this is showing up really, really good. Now what's another way to do it? Let's put this back at the 0.6 of an inch, or I can just do this right here, undo. And let's undo this again. And there we go. 0.674 is where we started out. So I can change this height right here to 0.15 of an inch for an example. And what that's going to do is lower the whole image down. And it still has a little bit of material at the bottom. Exactly 0.15 of an inch. But you can see now that we're really, really close. There's only one spot that's sticking up. So if I change this to 0.6 of an inch, that's now right below the surface. So this is how you can maneuver these different little components to be able to get this where it will um, carve the way that you want it to. Let's go down and look at the cut style. There is several different ways. Now this is the full depth cutout and with auto tab, so it will actually cut this image out all the way around. Or we have another option. We can come down here, as I did with the pumpkin when I carved it, and this is where it's going to carve. It's going to carve down to that gray area, and you can see that there will be a little bit of material left at the bottom, and it will carve all of this material out. Now this material depth is the uh, 0.75 of an inch. That gives you the full thickness of that material. And I want to show you this too. You have some padding. You don't have to go all the way out to the edge of the material because you can see this is cutting out all of the material. What I can do is change this and cut it out as I did and I left about 3 eighths of an inch. So 0.375. And that will bring that in. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. 0.375. And you can see how that moved and brought it in. Let's go down to this one. 0.375. And the last one on the front is 0.375. Now what that has done is create a border for us. Now this border is 3 eighths of an inch. It's from the outer edge. That red line is actually where the cutter is going to stop on the engraving. So it'll create that pocket to that red line. And that will leave you 3 eighths of an inch from that red line to the outskirts of the edge of the board itself. So when I carved mine, that's what I did. I left 3 8 of an inch border all the way around, and that worked out really, really nice. Now, one of the things that I did is typically you want to be able to carve it with the grain of the wood. Now, I chose not to. I wanted to see just what this bit would do and how this programming would do. So I went on the x-axis uh, opposite the grain. What I could have done and have even a better, smoother um, engraving would be able to cut it on the y-axis. So that is the choices that you can make with this. Now up here as far as the bits, there are some standard bits that are built into this system and I used what they said. I used a one quarter inch end mill to be able to do the roughing pass, but I did speed it up because the default setting, whoops, let's close that one. I want to go over here to the cut settings now they were using 60 inches per minute, nine inches on the plunge rate, and 40% um, uh, step over. What I did is increase this to 78 inches per minute,
because I'm using the pine, which is soft wood. I left this the same. I left the step over the same. And I did put this at 0.1 of an inch. So that was a little bit aggressive. They had a smaller number in there to be able to create more passes. But I decided to step that up and use 0.1 of an inch. Over on the finishing passes, again, I used what they had suggested, which was a 1 8 inch ball nose bit. And I went ahead and used what they had suggested, 50 inches per minute, 25 inches per minute on the plunge rate, and a 10% step over. The, the step over, the closer that step over is, the finer the detail. So if I went with 5%, it would take a lot longer, but you'd get a little bit more detail out of it. So those are the settings that you have there. Once you take care of this, you're ready to generate the tool pads. Then I can just click on this, generate the tool pads, and then guess what? Everything else is the same. It is going to step you right through the checklist and get you ready to uh, carve. I'm setting this workpiece up a little bit different than normal. This is the actual width of the project in the computer, which is eight inches. This piece of material is actually 11 and a quarter, which gives me plenty of room to be able to attach. And then this will be the carving area right in here. Now these clamps will hold down the material and I will not have to worry about anything interfering in this area. The bit that I'm using for the roughing pass is going to be a one quarter inch. Now this is an upcut bit and um, I'm using this primarily because this is what I have. Uh, you could use a down cut bit to be able to get perhaps a little bit cleaner, but the finishing pass is going to take care of any uh, fraying of the material. So this still will be good because it will lift and get out all of the debris and the sawdust and the chips out of the area. So one quarter inch upcut bit is what I'm using. The first step of course is to hone the machine. So I'm gonna go through that process right now. Machine's now honed. I'm going to put the bit in here while it's easy to get to, and then I'll move it over and put it at the material X, Y of zero position. I have a bit right now at the work zero position on the X and Y axis. Now one point that I want to clear up, I did say that this was a uh, upcut bit. This is actually a downcut bit and that should give me a nice clean cut. This X that I'm placing right here is going to be the point that I'm going to Z the machine for the roughing pass and then when I come back to do the Z for the finishing bit I'll see it at the exact same point. It's very important to see the machine with these two bits at exactly the same location. You do need to make sure that all the sawdust is removed and that it is clean and smooth. Now this is a critical important step. You must do this. You want to be able to make sure that you Z both the roughing pass and the finishing pass. That bit must be Z at the same point. It also is very important that the surface is clean. This is going to generate an awful lot of sawdust. And if the surface is not clean, when you put that finishing bit in to do the Z probe, you're going to get a different height, and that is going to create a very uneven surface at the bottom of your project. So this is a critical step. Z it at the same point for both bits and make sure it's clean. At this point, I'm going to continue the checklist and I'm ready to be able to start the roughing pass and get this little jack-o'-lantern all cut out. One of the things I want to point out, if you look at the tool path, it actually looks like that they made some improvements here. There is less air time and a lot more carving time, and that's a good thing. Now the roughing pass is just about finished, but I want to point out something. I didn't use the dust boot because I wanted you to be able to see exactly what this was carving and I did have to vacuum this off several different times. But the good thing is the roughing pass is finished and I want to be able to show you this. I was running at the 78 inches per minute, 9 inches per minute on the plunge rate at 0.1. I want to give you a real good close-up look at the roughing pass. This creates the different layers and it removes as much material as possible 
so that it puts the least amount of stress on the eighth inch ball nose bit. Now this is the eighth inch ball nose bit that I'm going to use to do the finishing cut. Now this has the one quarter inch shank and I recommend using the quarter inch shank versus the eighth inch because it's just going to provide a lot more stability for you. I have the eighth inch ball nose in here and I'm moving back over to the exact same point to do the Z probe again. You want to make sure that this surface is nice and clean, free of any sawdust. And we'll put that down right there. Now this time we select a finishing pass and we click continue and we do the probe. Make sure that we have contact right there. Let's do that. And then we select probe and it does its thing. And we put the probe away now. And then I'm going to use the last XY0 position. Again, I'm not going to use the dust boot. I want to show you the process, but it does create just a ton of sawdust. And we'll hit the fire. Now the finishing pass has beginning, and because it's much slower and very detailed, it takes quite a bit longer. Now the and cutting time on this is just about three hours. Now you can see the bottom edge of the pumpkin starting to take shape, and it's very smooth. It's looking great. I can't wait to be able to see this project finished. At this point, the bottom portion of the mouth of the jack-o'-lantern is beginning to take shape. You can also see as this cuts along the x-axis, it's looking really good. Now remember, ideally, this would be carving with the grain rather than against the grain. But this is the little experiment that I wanted to do, and it's looking really, really good. At this point, we're nearing the completion, and I think you would have to agree, this is looking absolutely amazing. All of the detail that's in this particular jack-o'-lantern is really coming out. Now, the last portion of this carving is always the most exciting and the most fun to watch, because one, you know that it's almost finished, and to be able to see the detail in this, I think it's just amazing. So I'm very excited to be able to see the last little bit of the carving, and it's now finished. Let's give a close-up look at just how this is looking. Now this is still on the machine. I haven't done anything other than vacuum off all of the sawdust. Looks great. I am very happy that the Inventables team has put together this 3D uh, carving for the easel software. This is a game changer. It's very simple to be able to design and have very nice professional results. I want to thank everybody for watching this video today and being able to see this kind of results with 3D and easel. This is amazing and I want to be able to take the opportunity to thank the Inventables team for being able to put this together. I know that a lot of people have been asking for this for quite some time and what they have been able to do is put together such a very, very simple format that I think everybody will be able to have success with. So if you like this video, by all means, give me a thumbs up and don't forget, hit that little subscribe button down below. I would really appreciate it. And share this video with everyone and let everyone know that Easel is now having a 3D experience. And by the way, before I go, I want to be able to say, share with me the different types of 3D file that you're carving in your shop. Send me an email, send me a picture, and let me know. I can't wait to see the creativity that everybody's going to have with the new Easel 3D software. This is absolutely a game changer, and I can't wait to see what you guys are creating. So until next time, guys, I look forward to seeing you real soon. Bye-bye. Oh, and by the way, happy Halloween. I'm going to have to paint this. I think I'm going to just create some type of a frame for this, and I think the grandkids are going to love it. In fact, I may let them paint it.